Welcome to Abdomen One. We are talking today about um, Chapter One, which is just the introduction um, to abdomen. Um, so we just go through some basic things that you're going to need to know um, while scanning um, and for the rest of your life, basically, because you will be using these terms. You will um, be thinking about these positions anytime that you're scanning. So it's a pretty important chapter. So our objectives for this chapter are to identify the anatomic definitions in regards to directional terms, anatomic position, and anatomic planes. We will also wanna demonstrate the sonographic examination to include patient position, transducer orientation, image presentation, and labeling. We'll define the terms used to describe the image quality, and we'll describe the sonographic echo patterns to demonstrate how normal and pathological conditions can be defined using image quality definitions. We'll list and recognize the sonographic criteria for cystic solid and complex conditions. We'll describe the appropriate patient preparation for a sonographic evaluation, state what should and what should not be included in a preliminary report, and calculate the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy using the four outcomes of true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative. So are you tired yet? <laughs> it's a lot. It seems like a lot, but honestly, um, a lot of this stuff is pretty common sense too. So let's start with um, anatomic definitions and you've probably taken medical terminology. So this is, should just be a review. So we'll talk about our directional terms and our anatomic planes. We use these when describing anything that we are scanning. Um, so that's why it's important. That's why we need to like be very, um, we just need to know these terms very well. Uh, superior or cranial is toward the head. Um, inferior caudal is toward the feet. Anterior is toward the front or at the front of the body or a structure is in front of another structure. Posterior is toward the back or the back of the body. Medial is toward the middle or the midline of the body, and lateral is away from the middle of or the midline of the body. And honestly, these six terms, I usually in one of my scan am using these terms. So these are like really, really important um, with scanning abdomen, OB, um, vascular. You're going to need these terms in every single one of your um, scans. Ipsilateral is located on the same side of the body. Contralateral is on the opposite side of the body. That makes sense, right? Um, proximal is closer to the attachment. We use that all the time. Distal is farther from the attachment of an extremity to the trunk or the origin of the body part. So we're talking about like, let's say um, the common femoral vein. Um, it's a long vein that goes down your leg. We use um, terms as like proximal common femoral vein and distal common femoral vein. So proximal is closest to the extremity or the trunk or the origin of the body, while distal is further away with, um, in this, like toward the feet, basically. Superficial is toward or on the body surface and deep is away from the body surface or internal, which makes sense, right? So this drawing depicts a body in the anatomic position, standing erect, arms by the side, face and palms directed forward with the directional terms. So this is just a, um, we just kind of went over the terms and now here's a visual for you to kind of make help make sense. So um, anterior and posterior, proximal and distal, cephalic and caudal, medial and lateral. Here is another one talking about sagittal, 
and transverse, which we use a lot. Um, those are the planes that we scan in most of the time. So the standard anatomic position is used to depict the three imaginary anatomic flat surface planes. Both the sagittal and coronal plane passes through the long axis and the transverse plane passes through the short axis. And I'll let you look at that for a second. So what directional terms describes a structure that is closer to the middle? Now that I talked about it, what do you think? Is it A, proximal, B, distal, C, medial, or D, contralateral? It's C, medial. Where I really am thinking about like where we use medial and lateral is um, when we're scanning kidneys because we kind of scan through the whole kidney and we um, start at the mid kidney, like which is kind of in the center, and then we scan medial um, into the body, which is like more to the middle, and then we scan lateral out. Where are the iliac veins located in the relationship to the inferior vena cava? They're inferior, right? The iliac veins are inferior or caudal to the IVC. The confluence of the iliac veins forms the IVC. So they're below them, they're inferior in the body. So now we're gonna move on. And we're gonna talk about scanning definitions and patient position, which is another huge thing. So decubitus is the act of lying down, the adjective before the word describes the most dependent body surface. So supine is laying on the back, prone is laying face down, right lateral decubitus is lying on the right side, and left lateral decubitus is lying on the left side, or left side, right side. Makes sense, right? You'll need to know these for your test. You can also um, put a patient in oblique, and these are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go through them. But honestly, I scan pretty much in all of these positions. The only one that I don't scan very much in is prone, where the patient is laying on their tummy. Other than that, um, with <laughs> I scan every single, I put the patient in whatever position I need to get the best image of the body part I'm scanning. And this is just a picture of what we just talked about. So which position describes the patient lying on the right side? Is it A, B, C, or D? If you said B, you're correct. It's a right lateral decubitus. Alrighty, so let's talk about transducer orientation. Now, this is a huge learning curve this semester for you guys as you're going through intro. Um, I'm talking about abdomen and OB with you. Um, you have so much information go coming at you. Um, but this is like your first thing you got to know is how do you orientate the probe, the transducer that you're scanning with, um, and how it's going to be looking into the body. Both the path, path of the sound and the path of the returning echoes are viewed on the monitor. So the scanning plane describes the transducer's orientation to the anatomic plane or the to the specific organ or structure. You remember that picture of that man that was standing there and there, there was all these lines going through them? That's how um, the scanning plane is. So the sonographic image or the sonogram is a representation of the sectional anatomy. You'll be taking sectional anatomy. You probably have had some sectional anatomy by now. Um, so you can kind of understand that. So the term plane combined with the adjectives 
is sagittal, parasagittal, coronal, and transverse. So any image that we take, we label either, is this a sagittal image, is this coronal or transverse? Because we need to show the radiologist or the doctor that is reading this, how we are looking into the body at that time. So a parasagittal plane provides a longitudinal section of the kidney on the sonogram and picture A. So you're holding the probe parallel with the body basically. In picture B, the coronal plane provides a coronal section of the sonogram. And I love these pictures, and I want you to study these pictures, especially the one on the right, as it shows you how you're looking into the body, which part, when you're looking at the screen on the, the top part is going to be anterior on, let's talk about image A, and the bottom part is going to be posterior, the left side of the screen is going to be superior towards the patient's head, and the right side of the screen is going to be caudal or inferior. And that's when you're holding the probe like that. When you're holding the probe a different way or scanning a different way into the body, it's going to be different. So I really want you to study these. These are going to help you throughout this semester because as you're learning all this information, it's going to get kind of confusing when you start scanning. And so if you can orientate yourself, if you can get in the position where you know which way you're going or what you're looking at, how you're looking at like a part of the body, um, that's gonna help you out so much. So transverse, we turn the probe 90 degrees and we're looking at it um, perpendicular kind of with the body. And so we're scanning a different way into the body. So what term is correctly described an anatomical image obtained by recording returning echoes? And this is like a huge thing. And the um, key word in here is anatomical image. And it's a sonogram. A sonogram is a sonographic image of a representation of returning echoes from an organ incinated using ultrasound. So that's the difference between son ultrasound and sonogram. You are gonna be a sonographer. You take images with an ultrasound machine of the body. So what scanning plane and section was used to obtain a sonogram of this left kidney? Do you guys remember the PowerPoint right before? What do you think? The sonographer scanned the patient using a D, transverse plane, and obtaining a transverse section of the left kidney on the sonogram. So this is like, sometimes I explain um, to patients or students, like we have a loaf of bread and we're scanning, taking slices of the body, like we would take slices of the bread. So you're looking down into the body in sections with transverse. All right, so now we're gonna do image presentation. So sonograms are images coupling the body, organ, or structure plane terminology with transducer placement to describe the sectional anatomy, basically. Anterior, posterior, right, and left body surface is scanned in the sagittal, parasagittal plane, coronal, and transverse scanning planes. For organ or structure, the body surfaces are scanned with different transducer inculations and obliqueness to obtain longitudinal, coronal, or transverse scanning planes. With a few exceptions, the transducer at the scanning surface is presented at the top of the image. The exceptions are endovaginal, endorectal, or a transversor on top of the neonatal head. Other than that, um, the transducer scanning surface is presented at the top. So your top is gonna be your anterior. 
So there's six scanning surfaces with three anatomic planes produce 14 different imaging presentations. I know it's so confusing, but I promise you, the more you do it, the easier it'll come to you. So with a sagittal plane, you can scan supine or prone. Um, I don't really scan prone, maybe for a kidney, maybe, um, but I always scan sagittal. We're always scanning a patient laying on their tummy or on their back, not tummy, excuse me. So for this, when you're scanning the sagittal plane, look at how the image would appear on your screen. So the top of the surface is going to be anterior. So that's going to be the skin surface. And then you're going to go deep into the body, which is posterior, like towards the spine. The left side of the screen will be the superior and the in caudal part of the screen will be inferior. Coronal planes are a little bit different. Um, you're scanning left and right more. but it's still um, the skin surface of the top of the screen. When you're doing transverse, you're still seeing the skin surface at the top of the screen, anterior and poster. The difference is you're looking right and left, which is switch. So it's a reverse. So on the right side of the screen is actually the left side of the patient or the left side of the body. Um, on the left side of the screen is actually the right side of the body. So it's flipped. And if you're doing transverse plane, you're gonna do anterior and posterior, left and right. We scan um, kidneys a lot on their side. So this is how you would be looking into the body. We do transvaginal ultrasounds a lot on patients. And um, I do a lot of transvaginal ultrasounds um, at my work um, because I'm looking at getting a closer look at the uterus. We're looking at the endometrial lining. If there is a first trimester baby, we're looking at that when I can't see on the tummy. Um, so it's just a closer look into the body. So the image of the presentation on the left illustrates a sagittal plane and the one on the right is a coronal plane. On either presentations, the apex of the image seen on the monitor corresponds to the anatomy closest to the face of the transducer. I'll let you look at that for a second. Endorectal images are sometimes done um, for prostates and men um, if they're going to do a biopsy on a prostate um, in the hospital. Um, so this is how that would look. The image on the left illustrates a sagittal plane and the one on the right is a transverse or coronal plane. On either presentation, the apex of the image seen on the bottom of the monitor corresponds to the anatomy closest to the face of the transducer. And it just takes time. You don't need to know these all today. You just need to study them. And the more that you scan, the more it'll come to you. I promise. If you get lucky to work in a hospital someday, um, we do um, baby heads. So if a baby is born early, sometimes they can have bleeds within the brain. And so we scan for bleeds with the patient being scanned from either the anterior or posterior surface with or without obliquity. The image seen on the monitor demonstrates the scanning surface anterior or posterior and superior and inferior are being examined. You don't have to worry about this right now. You really don't have to worry about the endorectal right now. Um, endovaginal, you need to know. Um, Transverse sagittal coronal planes are the huge ones that I want you to really like study this next week. So what surface would appear on the top of the sonograms 
with the patient scanned in a right lateral decubitus position, and the transducer was placed in a longitudinal plane around the left surface. Hmm. So if right lateral decubitus, that means they're laying on their right side, correct? And so we are going, the left side is going to be up. So the top of the sonogram demonstrates the left scanning surface. So you're going to be seeing the top of the skin, which is on the surface of the skin, which is the left side of the body. OK, let's go down the image quality definitions. These are huge. These are huge. You're going to be using these all the time. And you're probably going to be going over this in the intro. You're going to get the same information quite a few times, but hey, that's how you learn, right? So echogenic describes an organ or tissue that is capable of producing echoes by reflecting the acoustic brain. That means it's going to be bright. Describes a relative tissue texture. Aberration from normal echogenicity may signify pathology or poor scanning. You don't want it too bright. You want it perfect, <laughs> um, you're, but um, you don't want your images to be too bright or too echogenic. Um, and so that's something that you're going to learn in your scanning labs this week or this whole semester, but as you start scanning. Echogenic is bright. That's what you can think. Um, let's see. Let's think about some echogenic things. Okay, like echogenic. Um, Gallstones, gallbladder stones, or any kind of really stone is super bright. Sometimes a baby can have a bright spot in the heart called an echogenic itra, cardiac focus, and it's bright, it's white, it stands out against the other grays. So on this long longitudinal section in the supine position, the diaphragm, which is the arrow, white solid arrow is described as more echogenic or more bright than the normal texture of the right lo liver lobe, which is more echogenic than the renal parenchyma. And let you look at that. On B, in this patient, the transverse section demonstrates that the liver and pancreas textures have a similar echogenicity or isochoic. So they look about the same gray, right? The aorta, IVC, pancreatic head, pancreatic tail, right renal artery, SMV, superior mesenteric vein, those are all um, labeled on there for you. But can you see how on image A, there's a lot of different contrast. Um, you got white, a lot of white um, from the diaphragm, um, from the medulla of the right kidney, which is the center of the kidney. Um, So anechoic is another huge one that you're going to use all the time. And it describes the portion of an image that appears echo free. So it's more black. So examples of this, is like a, a bladder, a urine filled bladder, which you guys will see um, a bile filled gallbladder. So when your gallbladder is full, when you haven't eaten, you guys will be scanning that this semester. So you'll be able to see your gallbladders, um, a blood filled ventricle in the heart. Sonolucent or transomic are misnomers and should not be substituted for anechoic. So don't use sonolucent, don't use transonic, use anechoic. When you see something that's anechoic or black or straight through, it's the correct term. Um, some cysts can be anechoic in nature too. Here's an example of an anechoic gallbladder. See how nice and black it is. It's not like have any kind of grayish. It's just like straight anechoic. It's, there's no echoes. As you guys are um, learning about the gallbladder and the liver, um, 
it's going to be labeled for you. So GB is the gallbladder, surrounding it is the liver. Hyperechoic, hypochoic, echopenic, isochoic. I use hyperechoic, hypochoic a lot. Brightness changes occur if scattering amplitude changes from one tissue to another. So some things are going to be hyperechoic, some things are going to be hypochoic. Um, these are things that you need to know how to describe what you're seeing. So hyperechoic is echoes um, that are brighter than surrounding tissues or brighter than the normal tissue. Um, hypochoic are portions that are not as bright. So sometimes like I will scan an ovary and I will see a hemorrhagic cyst and a hemorrhagic cyst is, looks like a mass that is darker, basically a darker shade of gray than the rest of the ovary. So I'll describe it as a hypochoic mass measuring three centimeters is seen in the right ovary. So it's darker than the um, ovarian tissue basically. Echopenic is a structure less echogenic than others or has few internal echoes or isochoic is a structure of equal echodicity like we saw in that one picture. So this is a image of the long and tutal section of the right kidney. The renal capsule is normally a specular reflector and is hyperechoic compared to the surrounding tissues. The renal cortex is homogeneously echogenic and the pyramids seen in the medulla become more prominent and can change from hypochoic to anechoic with um, increasing diuresis. Um, the, the area labeled shadowing is caused by a bowel gas and is due to low reflectivity or um, referred to as soft or dirty shadow. Homogeneous, heterogeneous, I use these a lot too. So this homogeneous refers to an image echoes of equal intensity. So a homogeneous portion of the image may be anechoic, hypochoic, hyperechoic, echopenic, but it's the same throughout. So a liver is going to be like more homogeneous. It's going to be the same um, gray build throughout. It's going to look the same. It's going to be pretty. It's going to, um, in a healthy liver, mind you, it's going to um, just be very smooth. I think smooth is a good way to um, describe homogeneous. Heterogeneous is more complex. It has different echoes. Um, like a kidney, it has like we just saw, like it has the pyramids that are more anechoic. It has the uh, medulla, which is more echogenic. It has the cortex, which is more hypoechoic. And so it's all different textures brought into one structure. Enhancement and shadowing, that's another thing that's huge because that really can describe pathology. And um, my one of my things that I like to talk to my students about is usually when there's acoustic enhancement or acoustic, um, it's more simple. It's more um, just filled with a simple fluid that isn't usually malignant. It's more benign. Um, when I see shadowing, I get a little bit nervous, especially in the ovaries. If I see a mass that is shadowing, that means that um, the mass is taking the sound basically and not reflecting it. It has like um, probably some stuff in there that is um, malignant, like cancer. And you're going to see this in breasts too. It's huge in breasts. Like shadowing um, masses is a huge telltale sign for breast cancer. So enhancement is increased acoustic signal amplitude returning from region slime be beyond an object that causes little or no attenuation of the sound beam. So it just kind of goes through. It's like, hello, I am not mean. I am going to let you through. 
shattering redu um, is reduced echo amplitude from sound, not transmitting due to attenuation or low reflectivity. So an echogenic calculi attenuates sound. Um, cancer <laughs> attenuates sound. Um, bowel gas attenuates sound. So um, I feel like shadowing is more like masses are more mean. They take the sound. They don't want you to get it back. <laughs> and that's the way that I can kind of tell sometimes if something is more malignant or benign. So this is a simple cyst in the kidney. So this is just little, like probably this guy just has a cyst that's so getting kind of large, um, but it, it looks like a simple cyst and it has um, it just more anechoic, like we said. Um, and beyond the cyst, posterior to the cyst, you can see it's really bright and that's what we call acoustic enhancement. So the sound was able to just like go through really easy. Um, in image E, the transverse gallbladder is from a patient with cholecystitis, um, a thickened wall, um, but also um, a cholelithiasis or a gallbladder stone is creating an acoustic shadow due to attenuation. So beyond the stone there that is in the arrow, um, the two double arrows is showing acoustic shadowing. All right, so what term describes images of equal intensity? Homogeneous, echopenic, echogenic, or hypochoic? If you said homogeneous, you are correct. What term describes reduced echo amplitude due to attenuation? C, shadowing, acoustic shatterings describe reduced echo amplitude from regions lying beyond the attenuating object. Okay, so let's get down to business here on interpretation of sonographic characteristics. A cyst diagnosis is based on a sonographic characteristic of criteria. Okay, you guys gotta know this, gotta know this. This is like, start writing notes here. So cysts retain an anechoic center, even at the highest instrument gain setting. So you can turn it, turn it as high as you want and you still see like a, like pretty much a black anechoic area, that's a cyst. The mass has sharply defined posterior wall indicative of a strong interface between cystic fluid, tissue and parenchyma. There is increased echo amplitude in the tissue beginning at the far wall and proceeding distally compared with surrounding tissues. This is called acoustic enhancement. Reverberation artifacts can be identified at the near wall of the cyst, which we'll talk about a little bit. Edge shadowing artifacts may appear depending on the incidental angle of refraction and the thickness of cystic wall at the periphery of the structure. And you're gonna learn about reverberation and edge shadowing probably in intro. Okay, so here we go. This cyst right here, does it have an anechoic center? Yes. Is there a sharply defined posterior wall? Yes, there is. Is there acoustic enhancement? For sure there is. I can see it extra bright beyond the cyst. Can you see reverberation artifacts at the near wall? Looks like it. Reverberation basically is um, just where you're gonna get a little bit of artifact is not real, but it looks like little grayish, a little bit more of a gray tone than black um, at the top of the um, cyst because of how the sound is hitting it. And there's some edge shadowing artifact. And so those are your criteria for a cyst. So a solid structure may have a hyperechoic, hypochoic, echopenic, and anechoic homogeneous echo texture, or it may be heterogeneous. It all depends on what it is. They usually have internal echoes that increase with increased instrument gain. The array, array like 
they're usually irregular, often poorly defined walls and margins, and they have low amplitude echoes or shadowing posterior to the mast due to increased acoustic attenuation by soft tissue or calculi. So solid is a transverse section right liver lobe with a hemangioma. So there's the liver there and you see that bright white circle, that's what we call a hemangioma and we'll learn all about that. So the benign solid mass presents with the following sonographic criteria for a solid mass. Internal echoes that increase with increased gain settings. So as we turn up our gain and we turn up um, our brightness on our machine, it's also going to increase. But you can also see low amplitude echoes by the arrow or shadowing posterior to the mass. A complex structure usually exhibits both anechoic and echogenic areas on the image, originating from both fluid and the soft tissue components within the mass. So the relative echogenicity complex soft tissue mass is related to a variety of constitutes, including collagen content, interstitial components, vascularity, and degree and type of tissue de degeneration. It all depends. You, some complex cis, some complex masses um, are benign, some are malignant. So this is like an encapsulated mass in a complex structure exhibiting septa, which are those lines between the black areas and between echogenic and anechoic areas. So doesn't that just look nastier than the simple cyst? It looks like there's all sorts of just nasty tissue within it. So how, how would you um, know if it's cis solid or complex? So you use amplitude echoes distal to the mass structure or organ to evaluate the attenuation properties that look for acoustic enhancement. Um, Somalucent refers to masses, organs, or tissues attenuating little or acoustic beams, images, um, for example, like a cystic area. Masses attenuating large amounts of sound results in marked decrease in the amplitude of distal echo. Echoes. Okay, so I had to stop for a second because my computer is about to die. So I am coming back to it and we will keep going. So sorry about that. Okay, so like I was saying, <laughs> Um, well, we always, always have computer problems, right? There's always something. Okay, so like a sonolucent refers to like a mass or an organ or a tissue that is attenuating little of the acoustic beam. So like a six, cystic structure, like a gallbladder or a cyst in the kidney or a cyst, simple cyst in the ovary, it's going to um, be associated with acoustic enhancement. Masses attenuating large amounts of sound result in marked decrease in amplitude. So like a calculi with it um, is going to have sh like shadowing. Okay, so which sonographic characteristic is associated with a cystic mass sur surface? So cystic mass. C, right, because it retains an anechoic center. That was one of our criteria for that. What criteria should be used to evaluate the amplitude of echoes distal to a cystic solid or complex mass? B, 
is the correct answer, attenuation property. So we're looking for shadowing or we are looking for acoustic enhancement. You remember like complex solid masses, they take, they suck the, suck the sound while cystic just lets it go through. Preparation, we're getting down to the end. So the sonograph, sonographer <laughs> examination preparation includes gathering as much patient information as possible. So you gotta ask, you guys gotta ask so many questions because they do not freely give out information very much. Like these these patients come in, I'm like, why are you coming in? Um, I don't know. Yeah, my doctor just went in. I'm like, well, um, are you like having any pain? Oh yes, yes. I've been in pain for like three weeks. I actually went to the ER. I don't, you know, you have to like probe for questions. You need to know everything. Like, where's your pain? Have you had any nausea and vomiting? I'll teach you how to ask all these questions. Clinical information. Have you ever had a gallbladder? Um, scan before. Um, have you had your gallbladder out? I've had people just not tell me that they've had their gallbladder out. I can't find it. And then I'm like, have you ever had any surgery? Like, oh yeah, I have my gallbladder out. I'm like, I've been looking for it for like <laughs> 10 minutes. I can't find it. Um, clinical assessment and the level of patient apprehension. Those are things that we need to think about. Okay, so a little bit, you guys have probably researched about being a, so a sonographer. And after you, so you kind of know the drill, but you'll learn a lot more as you go through this semester and, and get into clinicals. So basically you, we do our scan. Then we write up a preliminary report for the doctor who's gonna be reading this. Um, it is hugely important that we write very good preliminary reports, and we take very good images because the doctor doesn't see what we don't give them. And they need us to help them a lot. Sonographers are really, there is a huge relationship between the doctor who is reading and the sonographer. They rely on us a lot because they have to trust us. So we need to know how to document. So the minimum image documentation, facility, date, and time, that's going to be pretty much on your worksheet from the, your computer. Um, instrument and transducer information, that's also on just the screen. Intensity, MI, and TI, those are on the screen. <laughs> um, patient identification, age, and gender, those usually pop up on your work list, um, but sometimes you will have to um, type that in. That's going to be stuff that you type in before. Operator identification, they want to know who does the scan. And icons, body position, transducer orientation, image orientation, if appropriate. So I'm constantly you have to label every single one of your images. So as we learn how to scan an abdomen, like one of our first images is gonna be pancreas. So I have to say transverse pancreas. How are you looking at the pancreas? You're looking, are you looking at in sagittal or are you looking in transverse? So they need to know this so they know how to look at the image. On your preliminary report, you have to put the patient's name, the date of the examination, relevant clinical information that may include classification of disease code, like why are we doing this? What kind of symptoms are they having? Specific examination requested, and the name of patient's healthcare provider and contact information. So the technical impression worksheet should provide key sonographic findings. Ideal, the son sonographer and the sonologists, or that's a good person who reads it, radiologist um, or OB or <laughs> perinatologist, whoever is reading your exams, together determine documentation is sufficient and examination is complete. I love this slide because this kind of just goes through 
what you need to do. So there was one time when I was a young sonographer and I saw this huge mass in the pelvis and I was nervous because I think because we go through all of the um, disease processes within like abdomen, vascular, you know so much, but sometimes you just don't know what it is. Um, and so I didn't know how, what to do because I'm like, I have never seen anything like this before. I don't know how to do this. And that um, more seasoned tech said, that's okay. You don't have to know what it is, but these are the things that you need to say. You need to measure it. You need to know how big it is. You need to tell what kind of echogenicity is it? Is it anechoic, hypochoic, hyperchoic? You need to know the texture. Is it heterogeneous or homogeneous? Where is it? you know, is a huge one. Um, is there distrib is there like diffused or focal distribute distribution? Um, how are the walls? Are they smooth? Are they irregular? Um, are there lots of abnormal amounts of fluid collection? The scope of a sonographer. Oh man. <laughs> So the general scope of a sonographer, and this is what I want you to know, is when you start out as a sonographer, you need to do what you feel comfortable with. The physicians are the ones that provide a diagnosis or interpretative report. Interpretive report. You are not. What your job is is a delegated agent of the physician and do not practice independently. So sonographic findings, you describe an echogenic mass attached to the gallbladder ball, gall bladder wall that does not move as the patient changes position. The diagnosis is the patient has a polyp. So you describe what you see, the physician interprets it. And I want you to do this. I want you to practice this as you are a student into um, your first couple of years. Soon you'll feel pretty comfortable in saying polyp in the gallbladder wall or possible polyp or appears to be polyp or appears normal. You know, that's all stuff that you, as you get um, into this profession, you as you feel comfortable, um, you might say more, but as a young sonographer, I want you to stick to the facts. Like, what did you see? Not, what do you think it is? So who can legally provide a diagnosis on the basis of evaluation of the son sonographic finding? Who is responsible? It's the physician, right? You give your preliminary report. That's why it's preliminary. It's not a final report. All right, let's talk about our last thing here. So the four possible test results for each examination correlated to independent determination of disease. The true positive result, the sonography findings were positive and the patient does have the disease. True negative result, the sonography findings were negative and the patient does, have, does not have the disease. So that's what we um, hope for, right? We wouldn't be right. We wouldn't be correct in our diagnosis. False positive, the sonography findings were positive but the patient does not have the disease or pathology. The false negative, is the sonography findings were negative, but the patient does have the disease or pathology. That's scary. That's the part I get nervous about. I don't wanna not be able to find a clot or find a mass that's malignant somewhere or not find an ectopic that was there. That's why it's so important, our jobs, because we help diagnose by our eyes and our skills. So what we're going to try to really cut down are the false positive and false negative results. But we are humans, correct? 
and we're not perfect, but we need to get as close to these not happening as we can. So sensitivity describes how well the sonography examination documents whether disease or pathology is present. If the number of false negative examinations decreases, the sensitivity of that examination increases. Specificity describes how well the sonography examination documents normal findings or excludes patients without disease or pathology. If the number of false positive examinations decreases, the specificity of the examination increases. Accuracy of the sonography examination is its ability to find disease or pathology if present and to not find a disease or pathology if present, not present. So the statistical parameters are the positive predictive value, the probability that subjects with a positive test, test truly have the disease or pathology. Negative predictive value is the probability that patients with a negative test are free of the disease or pathology. If parameter is expressed in fractions between zero and one, the parameter needs to be multiplied. But basically, um, we some tests are better than other tests when it comes to sonography too. Um, and it kind of depends on the patient's body habitus. Um, sometimes you just can't see as well. And so the accuracy of that um, test could go down. Um, so we try to do our best, um, but there, it is just a screening tool when it comes down to it. And ultrasound doesn't always see everything. But as young sonographers and throughout these next few years, I'm hoping that I can get you to a point where we eliminate these um, just um, false positive and false negative tests. Um, but yeah, so thanks for joining me today and I appreciate you being here and I hope you have a good day. Bye-bye.